may I start with you, Professor Heller? Thank you. It's an honor for me to be here. Uh, and like all of the other people who've spoken, I want to express both my, my respect and my support and solidarity for everyone that was affected by this terrible massacre. Um, I'm not an Iran expert, so I will focus more on the law in my presentation. And I want to touch on two issues. Uh, which crimes were actually committed during the 1988 massacre, and then what avenues might exist for some kind of accountability. Um, before I begin, I do need to say that I'm offering my opinions in a personal capacity. I'm not appearing on behalf of or speaking for the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICC. Um, so in terms of crimes, we are, of course, as we've heard a number of times today, primarily speaking about crimes against humanity, uh, many crimes against humanity were committed in 1998. In fact, it would probably be quicker to discuss the crimes against humanity that Iranian government officials did not commit that year than the ones that they did. So I think there are seven basic crimes against humanity that are relevant here. The first is perhaps the most obvious, and that's murder. Uh, the crime against humanity of murder is very straightforward. Intentionally or knowingly causing the death of even one person will qualify as long as it is in the context of a widespread or systematic attack on a civilian population, which is undeniably the case for the 1988 massacre. The second one um, is extermination. This crime against humanity differs from the crime against humanity of murder simply by scale. Uh, it requires the death of many people. We don't know exactly how, much, how many qualify, but certainly not just one. Um, by any standard, tens of thousands of murders of innocent people would qualify as extermination. Um, it's important to note, kind of as a jurisprudential matter, that international criminal law doesn't require the individual perpetrator to have personally caused many deaths, although someone like President Raisi clearly did. It's enough that the perpetrator caused the death of one person as part of a larger program of extermination. The third one, imprisonment or severe deprivation of liberty. Uh, the key to this crime against humanity is that the imprisonment or the deprivation of liberty must be arbitrary, not imposed following a legal proceeding that satisfies international standards. This crime clearly applies to all of the victims in the 1988 massacre, uh, those who were not serving a prison sentence when they were rounded up and executed, as well as prisoners who were still in prison when they were executed despite being entitled to release. As we've heard again and again, the death commissions held what can only be described as show trials, their outcomes predetermined. Fourth crime against humanity is torture. This one is very straightforward. It implies not only to the executed themselves, who must have suffered terribly knowing their fates, but also to the prisoners who escaped execution but were physically tortured or caused massive mental harm through actions such as mock executions. The fifth crime, persecution as a crime against humanity. This one involves depriving individuals of one or more of their fundamental rights under international law by virtue of their membership in an identifiable group. Now, the victims in the 1988 massacre were deprived of their right to life, perhaps the most fundamental right of all under international law. And they were deprived of their right to life on the basis of their membership in a political group, and also perhaps on the basis of religion, an issue that I want to come back to. That is the crime against humanity of persecution. Sixth, enforced disappearance. I don't need to spend much time on this one because we've discussed it many times today, but each and every individual responsible for arresting or executing or refusing to acknowledge the fate of even one victim committed the crime against humanity of enforced disappearance. And then seventh and finally, other inhumane acts. This crime against humanity is what we call a catch-all provision. It applies to acts that don't technically qualify as one of the specific crimes against humanity, but are both similar to them and cause a similar degree of physical or mental harm. I believe that this crime against humanity would apply to the suffering experienced by the families of the executed prisoners. The mental suffering that they experienced by not knowing the fate of their loved ones is, I think, inarguably severe enough to qualify as an other inhumane act. Now finally, with the crimes before I turn to genocide, with regard to all of these crimes against humanity, it's important to emphasize that criminal responsibility is not limited to those who actually carried out the executions. It extends to include anyone who ordered the executions, such as now President Raisi, as well as to anyone who aided and abetted the executions 
such as the individuals who arrested the victims, refused to acknowledge their whereabouts, or even who simply helped cover the executions up. All of those individuals are criminally responsible for crimes against humanity. Now, I also want to say a couple of words about whether the 1988 massacre qualifies as genocide. Uh, this is a more difficult issue. I think, from a legal perspective, because genocide, unlike the crime against humanity of persecution, cannot be committed against political groups. Political groups were specifically excluded from the Genocide Convention. But that isn't, I think, the end of the story. Uh, Jeff Jeffrey Robertson, who you heard from earlier, and a number of other experts have argued that the victims in the prison massacre were actually targeted, at least in part, because of their religious beliefs beliefs that dictated their opposition to the regime. And this, of course, is supported by the fatwa itself, which, as you all know, reads in relevant part, as the PMOI do not believe in Islam, and as they are waging war on God, it is decreed that those who are in prison throughout the country and remain steadfast in their support are waging war on God and are condemned to execution. Now, a victim of genocide does not have to objectively qualify as a member of a different religious group than the perpetrator. It is enough that the perpetrator perceives the victim to be a member of a different religion. So I think it's at least arguable that the 1988 massacre qualifies as genocide of a protected religious group. And I'll come back to that in a second with accountability. So accountability. We have all these crimes. What can possibly be done? Well, we do need to acknowledge that the court that I'm involved with, the International Criminal Court, is not a possibility here. Uh, Iran is not a member of the court, so it is not subject to its jurisdiction. And in any case, the executions took place far too long ago for the temporal jurisdiction of the court to apply. The court can only prosecute acts that are committed after 1 July 2002. So the more promising route is one that we've heard discussed today, which is universal jurisdiction, um, a state other than Iran prosecuting the Iranian perpetrators. As you know, we already have an example of a successful universal jurisdiction pr prosecution, Hamid Nouri in Sweden, and I think we need many, many more such universal jurisdiction prosecutions. But individual states, and we have to acknowledge this, are limited in their ability to build strong cases against Iranian perpetrators, against any perpetrator who commits a crime on another state's territory. So I really want to echo Amnesty International's call for the creation of an international investigative mechanism for Iran, one like we have already seen created for Syria and Myanmar. Such a mechanism would be invaluable for developing the evidence that states will need to conduct successful universal jurisdiction prosecutions. Now I want to end by mentioning an, one more avenue of accountability, and that's the International Court of Justice. Now the International Court of Justice is not a criminal court. It doesn't hold individuals responsible. It holds states responsible for violating international law. But the court does have the power to order states to take actions to promote criminal accountability for perpetrators of international crimes. The question here is, once again, jurisdiction. Iran does not accept the court's jurisdiction for general violations of international law, so another state can't go to the ICJ and simply claim that Iran violated international law during the 1988 massacre. Iran also hasn't ratified the Torture Convention, which per permits any state that is a member of the Torture Convention to bring any other state that is a member of the Torture Convention to the court to resolve a dispute over torture. But, and this is the important but, Iran has ratified the Genocide Convention, and the Genocide Convention contains a similar dispute resolution provision. Here's the text of Article 9, and, and please forgive the legalese. Disputes between the contracting parties relating to the interpretation application or fulfillment of the present convention, including those relating to the responsibility of a state for genocide or for any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3, shall be submitted to the International Court of Justice at the request of any of the parties to the dispute. So what does this mean? It means that insofar as the 1988 massacre can plausibly be described as an act of genocide, any state that has ratified the Genocide Convention and there are 152 other states than Iran, could bring a case against Iran at the ICJ. Now, such cases, even a few years ago, would have been unthinkable. But cases involving the Genocide Convention via this article have become increasingly common. We've seen two in the last year alone, as you probably know. Gambia accusing Myanmar of committing genocide against the Rohingya, and South Africa accusing Israel of committing genocide against Palestinians. Now, I think that the genocide question, though certainly not an easy one, is close enough that the ICJ would be likely 
to accept a case accusing Iran of being responsible for genocide. Now, a state would have to bring that case. Individuals do not have the right to trigger the court's jurisdiction. But if a state that wanted to bring the case could be found, it could request the court impose what are called provisional measures until a final decision was issued. Such provisional measures could include, among other things, ordering Iran to prosecute the perpetrators of the 1988 massacre and to release all of the information it has on the victims of the massacre, particularly the locations of where the dead are buried. Now, we all know Iran would almost certainly refuse to comply with any such provisional measure, particularly against its current president. Uh, regardless, a case at the ICJ would bring significant international attention to the 1988 massacre, as it has to the plight of the Rohingya and the Palestinians in Gaza. And a refusal to comply with the world's highest court would simply reinforce Iran's status, so very well earned over the past five decades, as a lawless pariah state. So hopefully that's food for thought. Thank you.